Far Cry 3 is generally considered to be the best Far Cry, but Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon is the one that has a fandom onto itself, much like Far Cry 2. I find that intriguing because I've never actually played it. This is actually the only game I haven't played in the Far Cry series since before starting this essay series. Many, many people swear Blood Dragon is the best, and it's also not uncommon for people to say it's the only good one, or that it's the only they've actually played and they couldn't be bothered to play the rest. So I'm going into this with a little bit of hype, because how could I not? My prediction is that I'll like it quite a bit, but probably not more than Far Cry 3, but probably better than Far Cry 2 and 2004. I'm also fairly aware of the wackiness of this game, and its huge inspiration from the decade of neon lights and cyber aesthetic, the 1980s. Basically, I think it's a lot of nostalgia bait, and I'll just be blunt. The main reason it's popular is probably because it's nostalgia bait, in my opinion. The 1980s has been nostalgia baited at an increasing frequency as of late, especially with properties like Stranger Things being a massive success. But Blood Dragon was a bit ahead of that curve, and I wonder if it being one of the first to lean so hard into it was what made it gain a life of its own as a proper game and not just a spin-off. Personally, I don't think spin-offs are any less valuable than mainline games, but that seems to be a common opinion in the gaming world. Oddly enough, this game got way more fanfare than the other spin-offs, Primal and New Dawn. I say oddly enough, but I think I know why, at least in part, and I'll be discussing that further in my Primal video. I also want to acknowledge I don't think this is nostalgia bait for the sake of marketing, but because I'm sure a ton of devs grew up in the 80s and wanted to pay homage to their childhoods. I don't think nostalgia bait is actually bad. I have a lot of contrary opinions to how the world views art, and that's one of them. I don't care if something is a soulless nostalgia cash grab. I think if people want to make it and people want to buy it, that's A-OK -okay with me. Not that Blood Dragon in particular is soulless, nor do I think it's even was intentionally made to be bait. You don't have to make something bait for it to actually act as bait. The devs clearly loved this game, and in development, Ubisoft just told them to do whatever they wanted and gave them free reign to do something unexpected by the fans, and obviously they went full throttle with that. So welcome to my fourth episode of the Far Cry essay series I've been doing. If you're new here, this series is a discussion of the Far Cry identity. In each episode, I am discussing each game in relation to what I'm calling the mainstream identity as well as the games before it. This mainstream identity is basically the image that Far Cry 3 conjured up as a gaming culture zeitgeist that still persists to this day. I'm doing this in an effort to understand each game and how the games have evolved over time, and whether Far Cry has actually lost its identity, which seems to be a fairly common opinion. I don't think it's a majority opinion, but it's definitely still fairly common. The curious thing is the series' identity is informed by the third game, and not the first one. Starting with Blood Dragon's reception seems like a good place to start, because I think it's an interesting bit of history in the series. As you likely guessed, it received extremely high praise, I'm talking 8s, 9s, 10s across the board, a 4.8 user rating on Google. Great stuff. This is interesting to me because, despite being a spin-off, it was treated with a fervor I've rarely seen before in the world of spin-offs. I wonder if Blood Dragon was made in 2020, at the height of 80s nostalgia, if it would do just as well, or better, or not as well at all. One can wonder. Reading Steam reviews, I've seen a lot of praise for how Blood Dragon innovated the series. This is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the reception to me, because again, I'm writing this before playing the game, and I can't imagine it did a whole lot to innovate on the series formula. It's worth noting, many of these reviews are from the last few years, not from when the game was released. So this is likely people getting nostalgia for Blood Dragon after seeing what the series has become as of late, and perhaps this wasn't much of an opinion in 2013. I'll definitely be keeping my eye out for how this game innovated over Far Cry 3. One more interesting thing to note is that the title is Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. This caused a bunch of confusion, whether it was a DLC or not. I suspect Ubisoft called it this because they had reused so much from Far Cry 3 and wanted to avoid criticism that a new game was reusing tons of assets. Looking at reviews from 2013, I don't see a single person mentioning the reuse of assets actually. Just something interesting to remember when we get further into the series with Primal and New Dawn. If you enjoy this video, there's a few ways you can show your support. Likes and comments are super helpful since the algorithm loves engagement, and you can also subscribe if you really want to show your support. The algorithm takes that as a sign that you like me a lot. And without further ado, let's talk about Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon.
As of writing this section, I'm about two and a half hours in and have been enjoying it a fair bit, but the developed in six months feel is definitely noticeable. It's rough around the edges, mostly the performance. Somehow it runs worse than Far Cry 6 with max settings, including ray tracing at 4K on a 2080 Ti. Oh, um, excuse me, 2080 Ti. The GeForce RTX 3080 Ti. My bad. I'm also super digging the humor. Doc, you play video games? Yes, Rex. Video games are a proven coping mechanism, like any hobby. They've been shown to improve hand-eye coordination, problem-solving, social interaction, and self-confidence. And no studies have managed to prove a correlation between video games and violence. Frankly, anyone who thinks games are bad for you is a fucking idiot. Hey, whoa, whoa, doc. No, Rex. Fuck stands for failing to understand our capacity for kindness. It's an acronym. Oh, I suppose this isn't a game anymore, is it? Even if there's a few references, I'm definitely missing out on. But hey, I got the Ninja Turtles reference, that's gotta count for something. Ooh. Just like Far Cry 3, Blood Dragon is referential at its core. While Far Cry 3 did this for narrative purposes, for pedagogical reasons, Blood Dragon just does it for the sake of humor. So I'll definitely not be pointing out a bunch of references in this video like I did with the previous one, because there isn't much of a reason to. Blood Dragon just does it for humor, and there's not much more to say about that. Also, this music kicks ass. Alright, it's been three hours since I wrote that last section and since I finished the game. I had fun, though ultimately I'm not super impressed. But I will say Blood Dragon did a good job of doing exactly what it wanted to. It's a tropey action fest soaked in neon, so... Let's get into it. I don't think there is any other way to start Blood Dragon than with an on-rails, neon laser, pop music filled romp with more lead than the US military fires in a year. We play as Rex Power Cult, a cyborg soldier of special make who has been sent to deal with a classified threat. We're with a pal of ours, Spider. After the turret section, we're treated to way too many tutorial prompts, just like Far Cry 3, except the developers took the criticism to heart and made it into a joke sequence rather than a constant issue. This is not cool. Moving allows you to go in many exciting directions. I found it rather funny and I appreciated its inclusion because it's a great way to show the developers actually understood the critiques and took them seriously while also having a little bit of fun with it. It's a gracious thing to do if you ask me. This tutorial establishes that we're in yet another Far Cry game. It's got the same stealth mechanics and the same movement options. Cool enough with me, but the stealth really takes a backseat in this game because Rex is more powerful than Jason ever was, pretty much even from the beginning. He takes no fall damage runs crazy fast, and does almost everything faster, like looting animations. He also knows all the takedowns from the beginning. The game also made rock throwing into D20 throwing, and as a D20 aficionado, I appreciate that immensely. Anyway, this tutorial section concludes with about 30 tutorial men menus in a row, and we're off to the races. Also, this is the only Far Cry game where x-ray tagging actually kind of makes sense, because it's all sci-fi and whatnot, and I assume they have that kind of a technology. Spider and Rex make their way down to a missile that needs disarming, and predictably, Spider dies. I did it! Yeah! Objective failed. What? complete. Coordinates uploaded. I'm no movie buff, but I know that it's mandatory for any 80s military action hero dude to have his friend die early on as a way to create personal motivation for the plot. Rex also just punches the rocket to disarm it. Nice. At the end of this mission, we find out the spider isn't actually dead, but then he actually dies for real. This cutscene also shows us the most forgettable villain in the franchise, though the other spin-off games definitely compete pretty closely in that regards, and his name is Sloan. Sir, what happened? They said you went off the reservation. It's gotta be a mistake. Ever since the nuke of Canada and the invasion of Australia, the world's been floundering something fierce. We've lost our way, gentlemen. Now the government, our government, talks reconciliation with the Red Menace. But I have a means to address the balance. Rex, he's lost it, man. Some evil dude who was Rex and Spider's commanding officer in the war against Russia before he went AWOL and started his Omega Force army of cyborgs. There is an interesting thing about Blood Dragon. 
that since it's leading hard into the 1980s, it holds on to some of the anti-communist propaganda. I find it hard to parse whether this game is even intending to be capitalist propaganda or not, or if it's supposed to be the critique of like the Red Scare or anything like that. I have my extreme doubts that anyone thought especially hard about it, but Dragon definitely isn't above satire given how much it uses satire to address some of the critiques from Far Cry 3. It's just that this game was made in 6 months and it's definitely enough time to make solid satire, but I doubt that was ever the intention. If this game is meant to be a satire of the super power bros of the 1980s, it definitely doesn't come across that way because Rex is never actually critiqued as a character. I'd also like to note something because I've noticed a large amount of ignorance around what satire actually is. Something being stereotypically over the top doesn't make it satire. Indeed, it's true that most satire is intentionally over the top, but that doesn't mean everything that is over the top is also satire. So Rex Power Cult being a ridiculously stereotypical action hero doesn't mean the developers were intending to critique that. I think it more likely they were just writing the stupidest character to go with the stupidest plot filled with the stupidest tropes from the time. This is on account of the fact that the developers said they intended on adding as many dumb 1980s tropes from the time period as they could possibly fit into this game and just have fun with it. Basically what I'm saying is that Blood Dragon is an ode to the movies they loved and not some sort of critique of the movies or the decade or the culture or the politics or anything of the 1980s. Given this fact, it's hard to know if developers were intending on addressing anything at all about the Red Scare, communism, or neoliberal politics in this game, but those things end up getting a little bit of lip service because of their commonplace existence in the 1980s. Anyway, that random sort of political rant aside, Ew. after this I realized that there's only seven main missions and decided to just do all the side content before finishing the rest of the main missions. So after this tutorial, we learn about blood dragons and clear our first outpost. We learn that Sloane has become supercharged with dragon blood. We also meet his assistant, who wants to betray him, so she acts as an agent inside for Rex. After that, I headed off to see what the world was all about. Blood Dragon as a whole is very different in vibe than the rest of the series for obvious reasons, the aesthetic being one of them. But it's not just that. The world just acts as a blank canvas for the game to sit on. This tropical island is the most bland that Far Cry has ever been. There's nothing interesting about it in the slightest, other than, I guess, the outpost. The thing that saves it is the way that Rex speeds across the land at a pace that puts Usain Bolt to shame. There's almost a laughable amount of random events also squeezed into every square inch of this island. Usually it's three or four scientists fighting against the cyborg menace. You can't go more than like 30 feet without seeing lasers flying around like a kid in laser tag. This is a good thing, otherwise the world would feel like it was very, very dreadfully empty because it kind of is. The other thing that helps the world not suck absolute donkey balls, the game is extremely short. Most people who 100% this game seem to do it in just a few hours. Mine was five and a half hours. That means that even though the world feels almost instantly stale because of its identical jungle style to Far Cry 3, albeit with less trees, that it doesn't suffer too hard because you only spend a little bit of time in it, especially if you only do the story mission, which I bet you could do in less than two hours, maybe even less than one hour if you really knew what you're doing. The neon lights also help quite a bit to change the scenery, and it's nice when you're actually in an outpost or story mission because they did quite a good job with those aspects and make them actually feel interesting and unique. But it is sad that Blood Dragon is the only Far Cry game where I can't really find myself able to walk around and enjoy the scenery and just be immersed in the world the way I could do in the other games, even in 2004 to some extent. This sounds like a big gripe, but at the end of the day, Blood Dragon's world is utilitarian in purpose and that works fine for such a short game. Moving into the side content, I was surprised by what I found. Blood Dragon introduced a few things I thought were added in Far Cry 4, but were actually started here. That's a thing I noticed in the other spinoffs too. Ubisoft likes to test new ideas in their spinoffs. That's what they did here with the new hostage situation missions and the assassination missions. In the former, you obviously rescue hostages. This typically requires stealth, since when the cyborgs spot you, they kill the hostage. Well, they're supposed to. I found that often it seemed bugged and they wouldn't actually ever kill the hostage. It happened in two, maybe three times in my playthrough. I I quite like these missions though because Far Cry is at its best when it puts minor pressure to act a certain way while allowing the sandbox to be accessed. So you're allowed to go in guns blazing, but you'll have to be quick. Or you can use any of the other stealthy options, which in this game is actually just the bow for a little while until you get upgrades on the other weapons to suppress them. Secondly are the Predator's Path missions that see Rex using specific weapons to kill something, usually a cyborg. This is a cool little evolution of our Far Cry 3, which had the assassination missions require the knife. I've always liked these kinds of things and I miss them in the most recent additions to the series. Speaking of evolutions of our Far Cry 3, the developers had an interesting 
conundrum with this game, that being the 6 month deadline. So they did what any good developers did, they streamlined things. Specifically the skill tree is what I want to talk about, or the lack thereof as it were. Funny thing, in my previous video I said I prefer a metered progression system where the player can just give upgrades for playing the game, then a number could be slapped on for narrative purposes that they needed it for. Now Blood Dragon doesn't have any narrative reasons for this being a skill tree, but it would seem they wanted to keep it around for some reason or another. So they added exactly what I was thinking. I really like this change. It means a player never runs into the issues with the skill tree which is inevitably having to pick something you don't want to get, or something that's not useful to you. Another interesting thing added was an upgrade system that doesn't actually correspond to new better weapons with straight up better stats like they do in Far Cry 3, or even Far Cry 2, but is instead replaced with upgrades directly to each weapon. So for each gun, even though there's only 7 guns, you feel the progression throughout a rather short game. The length here intersects in a strange way with the Far Cry formula because most of the games can be played in a couple dozen hours, which means that they needed a lot of weapons to be part of the player's progression. But in a 5 hour game, that doesn't necessarily need to be that way. But but this is a Far Cry game, so they needed to add something. It was a clever move to add upgrade ability to the weapons. But yeah, speaking of arsenal, it is small. You only get two types of throwables and seven guns. Three of the guns can't actually be upgraded, so there's a level of restriction in this that doesn't feel great by Far Cry standards. Seeing as Far Cry 2 and 3 had a huge selection, it kind of sucked to feel like I didn't have much to choose from. Personally, I hate the way the sniper and the pistol feels in this game, so I didn't use those. I mainly used the bow and the shotgun. It got a bit stale after 5 hours, but it wasn't too shabby. At some point, I accidentally started the second main mission that sees Rex taking out Sloane's power reactor to disrupt his power grid. It's just a straightforward mission with lots and lots of shooting. Given that this game is dedicated to being very stereotypical about the 1980s and video games as a whole, there's a defense section. Those are fun. Enough said. During this mission though, Rex gets a minigun. That's cool and all, but it feels dreadfully underpowered. Like, it feels just as lethal as a regular assault rifle, which is to say it feels very weak. It's good at taking down helicopters though, oddly enough. I also realized that grenades were buffed, like basically everything in this game. Rex gets so much health by the end, it's ridiculous. I also realized how inspired the humor felt by Borderlands humor, which isn't a bad thing, but I couldn't help realize that it feels so similar, and couldn't help but wonder if it was inspired. A reminder to all personnel to wash your hands after using the bathroom. When you shake hands with someone, it's like they're shaking hands with everyone you've ever known, including your mother. And you wouldn't want anyone touching your mother, would you? Please wash your hands. Oh, and I noticed there's another Honey Badger reference in this game. There is one in Far Cry 4 as well. I guess the Ubisoft devs must just really like the Honey Badger don't give a shit meme. Honey Badger don't care. Honey Badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. The next mission gives us a bit of world building that makes no sense, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't meant to make sense. Tell me, Doc, how'd you end up with that lunatic? After the U.S. stopped the Soviet invasion by nuking Canada, we had no home left. Someone offered us that, and a purpose. We also destroy blood dragon eggs with a flamethrower, but not to any dubstep, unfortunately. Speaking of blood dragons, it's in the title and we haven't actually talked about it. The blood dragons are cool and all, but they actually don't add much to the game. They're just really big animals that shoot you. Functionally, that doesn't add much to combat, because they don't do anything enemies don't already do in the game. They shoot things at you, just like the cyborgs, and they melee really hard, just like some of the animals. The thing that makes them a bit more interesting is that they have a weak spot on their chest. A tried and true trope that kills them real dead real fast. Otherwise, they're absolute tanks. I was hoping for more, maybe I was oversold the idea, but they're just not that cool. I'll touch on that in a little bit though. Part of what Blood Dragon did for Far Cry was add a bait mechanic. You can collect cyber hearts off of falling cyborgs and use them as bait for the Blood Dragons. This idea is of course a staple in the series by now. Not the Blood Dragon part, just the bait part. The main mission sees us dealing with one Dr. Carlisle. Doc, I'm near those coordinates. Listen, a man, Dr. Carlisle is helping Sloan build bioweapons, even though he knows he shouldn't. He was doing a really mean thing by making bioweapons that would use a dragon blood to turn everybody feral, completing Sloan's plan of turning Earth into a primal world again, or something of that nature. Again, it's not meant to make sense. The hang glider also makes its cameo here because it's not a Far Cry game without a hang glider. The mission ends with an arena and Carlisle dying for his AI companion. Send in more cyber soldiers! Unable to comply. This 8-bit piece of fucking hardware is obviously incapable of accommodating your superior needs. Please, don't kill me. Unable to comply. <laughs> 
rookie mistake, we've all done it. The final set of missions take you from the open world and put you in a linear section until you beat the game. This section was especially fun to me because Sloan takes away Rex's weapons and forces him to fight with only one at a time. He pits them against the Running Dead, which are zombies of Carlisle's making. Being stereotypical zombies, they can only die by headshots except for takedowns apparently, so I just killed them with takedowns, until I realized you can actually just jump high enough that you can kill them with death from above takedowns on the ground level. It's hilarious and I honestly loved it, I'm pretty sure it was a bug, but they probably just kept it in once they realized you could do it because it's really, really fun. In my previous video, I actually mentioned that dual takedowns are rare as hell, but in this arena, it is raining dual takedown. Anyway, Rex gets a super weapon that's called the Kill Star and then proceeds to have a training montage, very classic action movie. Then there's an absurdly long sex scene. Of course, Rex gets the girl that being Elizabeth Sloane's assistant. Apparently something happened to her, so he goes to get his revenge. And it's also never explained what happened to her. I love it. The next section is a big old power trip of lasers and kick-ass music. It was quite fun. The Killstar drains Rex's health as he uses it, which seems like an interesting mechanic, but it actually wasn't because the amount of health it drains is so low. Before we finish up the story, I want to shout out the outposts in this game. They're a step up in terms of level design over Far Cry 3, there's more verticality and enemies per outpost. I also love the way they shine a red or green light in the sky to show if it's been taken or not, it's a satisfying touch. They even added outposts that were like mining rigs in the water, it was pretty neat. Something that wasn't really done until Far Cry 6 again. Something I didn't love was the collectibles. They're more boring here than they've ever been. Probably because they add a good hour and a half to the runtime of this game, for no reason other than to just exist. It's a shame this carried on after Far Cry 3. Hell, it's a shame it carried on after the second game. Okay, you know what, it's a shame it was even in the second game. Rex will even remark how stupid they are, as if the developers know they're shitty. The silver lining here is that you don't need them to finish the game or anything. Anyway, back to the story. Then we have a monologue from Sloan about his ideological issues. Oh, damn it, Rex! And this is probably the closest the game gets to making anything approaching a political statement, with Sloan remarking against Democrats, presumably the Democratic Party of the US, implying he's likely a Republican. And since the villain is a Republican, we're supposed to see how Republicans are bad or whatever. This is character writing 101, everyone knows it. I highly, highly doubt that those were implying Sloan is like a socialist who hates the Democrats for being liberals, because that's way too much political theory for your average US citizen to understand. No offense to my fellow US citizens, it's not our fault the school system sucks, sucks donkey balls, and couldn't teach anyone that Democrats aren't socialists because they're liberals, and that liberalism is an actual political ideology with a real definition, not just some buzzword, and that it's separate from socialism, and that most socialists hate Democrats as much as they hate Republicans. The political parties, that is. Ew. Anywho, shit gets real gay here. What the hell is this? I am the Battle Armor Dragon Assault Strike System. Your kill star controls my brain cage, instructing me that you are my rider. Hello, gorgeous. I'm equipped with a hydraulically powered Terror 4000 cannon and titanium trauma plates. I think I'll take you out for a spin. We get a ride on a blood dragon with a mounted laser, and it's hands down the best part of the game. Finally, that leads us to the end of the game. Sloan and Rax have a final standoff that's a huge Star Wars reference. I gave you my memories, my experiences, my childhood. No! I programmed you. I made you. I am your father. No! And just like I expected, Sloan does a whole not so different trope thing. It's a good enough ending for a pretty good game. So what was this video about? Well, in the beginning I pondered how a Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon could possibly innovate upon the series. This question only popped in my mind because I've seen so many Steam reviewers parroting this claim. Well, I partially agree, there's some cool new mechanics and systems, and the Uppos definitely have a better level design. But overall, it barely feels like Far Cry in a lot of ways. In my Far Cry 3 video, I put forth a list of things that make Far Cry 3 what it is, and and subsequently the mainstream identity of Far Cry, which was 1. A theatrical and over-the-top villain that is philosophically informed. 2. A voice protagonist with a strong personality. 
3. A strong narrative to go with those characters. 4. A memorable set of side characters. 5. An open world with mostly forgettable side missions, collectibles, and of course the titular radio towers. 6. A variety of vehicles to traverse that world. 7. A faraway location that is unknown to the player. 8. A sandbox feel to gameplay. 9. A progression system tied to hunting, cash, and a skill tree that keeps track of that progression system. Blood Dragon definitely fits the over the top villain, but definitely fails to make him memorable. And he is philosophically informed, but not really in the way I meant. The protagonist is definitely memorable with a fairly strong personality. This game has an extremely weak narrative, which was very much intended on the developer's part. Maybe one memorable side character being Elizabeth, maybe Spider. The open world is definitely filled with forgettable stuff. It has no radio towers. There's very few vehicles. It's definitely an unknown location. The sandbox took a huge blow with this one, mostly in terms of the weapon variety. There's sort of a progression with hunting because killing animals just gives you cash, but there's no reason to get cash from them in particular, like in Far Cry 3, because in that game they drop pelts, which are specifically needed for specific upgrades. It all paints a picture that doesn't add up much to what Far Cry is in most people's heads, but despite that, the fervor surrounding this game is pretty insane. Something about Blood Dragon captured a lot of people's minds. I honestly suspect that it was the humor and the nostalgia bait, which is fine. But for me, Blood Dragon is a perfectly okay game that was good for 5 hours and not a moment longer. You won't have trouble finding people who have only played this game and couldn't care less about any of the others. Personally, it's my least favorite in the series. On an ideological front, these two games are very funny together. Far Cry 3 is all about critiquing the way we use violence in video games to have unrealistic power trips. Then Far Cry Blood Dragon just did that. I quote game director Dean Evans here. Running around with very big guns and shooting cyborgs in their faces while trying to avoid dragons that fire lasers from their eyes. It's quite the juxtaposition. I love it. Two very different ideas in the same game series. Even six months apart as well. Ultimately, I feel as if the hype around this game, even ten years later, still overpromised to me what Blood Dragon would be. I knew for sure it was overhyped going into it, and I cooled my expectations quite a bit. Nonetheless, I was still a little bit let down. My assessment has probably seemed negative, so I'll put it as plain as I can. Blood Dragon is a good game. It's enjoyable and well designed. You may have noticed I didn't tear the plot to shreds or anything like that. That's because the game intended it and completely nailed the bad plot. We're really proud of our bad script. In an age where polygons equal emotion, we went for something a bit different. 1D characters, terrible story, and minimal emotions, says Dean Evans again. Blood Dragon did exactly what it wanted to, and I commend it for that. I also wish to talk more about the way Blood Dragon is held to a different standard than the other spin-off games, but I will be saving that until the primal video, so I'll make this brief. I think Blood Dragon worked well for people because it was unique in its presentation, not its gameplay. I think it worked well for people not because it innovated massively over the third game, but because it was a love letter to a certain decade that a lot of gamers grew up in. I think that nostalgia colors the way this game is remembered. But that's okay, because it's fine that I don't get it. We're all allowed to enjoy ourselves, whether we like the same things or not. So don't beat yourself up if you can't seem to fit yourself into the way other people enjoy things. It's perfectly okay to enjoy things the way you like. Whether I get it, or you get it, or Billy Bob Joe down the street gets it, doesn't matter. Thanks for watching.